Order members, and it's time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, and we will start with listed questions. I call Lord Morrow. Number one. Uh, the draft uh, budget proposals for OFM DFM include a, a resource Dell allocation of 65.4 million, compared with the 2014-15 opening budget of 65.8. Million. This is a reduction of 0.6 per cent. The allocation includes 5 million for the historical institutional abuse inquiry, which is ring fenced, and an allocation of 3 million for the victims and survivor service. The impact, however, on the remaining areas of the department's budget is a reduction of 8.4 million, or 12.8 per cent. Additional pressures of 1.7 million have also been identified which gives a total estimated pressure for 2015-16 of £10.1 million. Pounds. While the draft resource budget will allow the Department to make progress on a number of priority programmes, there will be very significant pressures across the Department's activities, including its arms length bodies. To deliver these further reductions, the Department will scrutinise its entire budget, including staffing, administration costs, funding for arm's length bodies and funding for programmes. Within the Department, reductions of this magnitude will require cuts in staffing and the proposed voluntary exit scheme will be important in this regard. Action will also be required to constrain costs and to reduce discretionary spend. Funding for arm's length bodies and for programmes will also be impacted and the emphasis will be on ensuring that statutory responsibilities are discharged, contractual commitments met and programme for government and ministerial priorities progressed as far as possible within the available resources. While the Department will seek to ensure that impacts on frontline services are minimised, it will not be possible to fully protect budget areas from the impact of the proposed budget reductions. Thank you. And I call Lord Morrow for a supplementary. Thank the Deputy First Minister for his reply. Uh, in relation to the historical institutional abuse inquiry, which I understand is not scheduled to report until the year 2017. Is it likely that this is going to be another report that is going to be shelved due to the lack of funding? Well, the, the, the draft opening budget of 65.4 million for the department includes an allocation of 5 million for the historical institutional abuse inquiry, funding which previously would have been received in the year. The historical institutional abuse inquiry has been operating since the 1st of October 2012. In April 2014, the Chair asked for and was granted an extension of 12 months in view of the increasing complexity of the inquiry, and it's now, uh, as the Member said, expected to produce its report by January 2017. So th this has been, along with support for the Victims and Survivors Service, uh, a huge priority for the Department. Uh, we recognise that the uh, Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry has a very onerous task, huge responsibilities, and I think the fact that we have been uh, in a position to prioritise support both for the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry and for victims and survivors is a very clear indicator of how much a priority the First Minister and myself place on the outcome of these important uh, uh, exercises. <coughs> I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. We last concorde August come Buyakas Fosterlish and Hiadara Asokteragra. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for his answer. Um, but can I ask the Deputy First Minister, uh, does he support the proposal for five-party uh, budget talks with Downing Street and the Treasury? And does he agree with me that these talks should take place now, this week, uh, so that London for once and for all will acknowledge the particular financial needs of people here in Northern Ireland? Well, the, the, the First Minister and I have uh, long since recognised the, the importance of challenging the way in which our Black Grant in particular has been dealt with over the course of the four and a half years that the coalition government has been in power in London. And uh, it was at our initiative 
in the course of the last couple of weeks that we brought the uh, five party leaderships together uh, at a meeting in the Stormont Castle to discuss a joint approach to the huge challenges which all of our departments face as a result of the austerity agenda being deployed by uh, this uh, coalition government. And, and we obviously recognise that in the course of uh, this week, uh, there is an opportunity to directly, uh, and, and I think it's much more powerful if, if it's done with the five of us there being represented as opposed to just the First Minister and myself, to, to put what we think is a very powerful case in relation to the particular exceptional challenges that we face here. The problems that we face here are completely different to the challenges in the north of England, in Scotland or in Wales. And it has to be recognised that the uh, strategy being adopted by this uh, coalition government uh, is uh, detrimentally affecting the work of our executive and the work of this assembly. So yes, the short answer is that it's much stronger if we're united. And my sense of them, the discussions that both the First Minister and I have been involved in is that we do have a, a united approach among the five main parties in this uh, assembly. I'm going to call Mr. Danny Kenahan. Principal Deputy Speaker, and may I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for his responses so far. But would he agree that all ministers, or really all departments, should be agreeing whether it's to choose priorities or to look at ring fencing those services which each department has to deliver, which certainly affect health and safety, and particularly risk to death, or risk of death rather? Well, I, I certainly think that the. Uh, the, the draft budget, which is presently out for consultation, presents huge challenges for every single department in the executive. None of us are under any illusions about that. Uh, but I think it is also very, very important that whenever people are speaking about the challenges that we face and they talk about cuts from the executive, the cuts are actually being made uh, in London. The decisions are being made in London by the coalition government. And they are dictating the ability of our departments to deal with the huge challenges that we face across a range of issues. Uh, and of course, the member will be very conscious that prior to the, the last uh, general election, uh, the Ulster Unionist Party effectively signed up for what was a very negative, austere uh, budgetary agenda, which was coming down the tracks uh, at the behest of uh, the uh, coalition government. So, Obviously, departments have to, uh, with the resources that are available as a result of the cuts from London, uh, decide how to prioritise to ensure that uh, we deliver, as best we possibly can, support for frontline services. Thank you. And I call Mr Adrian McQuillan. Mr Speaker. Uh, securing the powers to lower corporation tax is a key priority for the executive to promote the growth of the local economy. Uh, we believe devolution of rates setting powers would enable us to rebuild and rebalance the economy towards greater uh, private sector and output uh, growth. Reducing the corporation tax rate should increase foreign direct investment and domestic investment, expand our economy and bring greater uh, numbers of higher value added jobs. There should be linkages to the wider economy through increased spending and growth, uh, rising incomes, and this should result in a larger private sector. Any future decision to reduce the corporation tax rate here will mean a reduction in the executive's budget. The published autumn statement states that the government will introduce legislation in this parliament subject to satisfactory progress in these issues in the cross-party talks. I call Mr. McCullin for a supplementary. Thank you. Can I thank the Deputy First Minister for his, honest, or his answer? Um, can you tell me actually what is he doing to achieve this and make sure that we do get the corporation tax devolved? Well, I think I've done quite a lot. I've been involved in all of the discussions, working with the First Minister, with the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment, uh, with the Finance Minister, including the previous uh, Finance Minister. And I think it is uh, clear to everybody that uh, there is uh, cross-party support 
in this executive, certainly among the major parties. I know there's one or two maybe discordant notes, but the overwhelming majority of the members in this uh, assembly uh, recognise that the prospect of us being in a position to create anything in the region of something like 50,000 new jobs uh, would be of tremendous benefit to our people. And I think given the track record, where even against the backdrop of a world economic downturn and the lack of corporation tax powers, we have managed to bring in more foreign direct investment jobs uh, here uh, than at any other time in the history of the state over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, just think what we can do if we have a lower rate of corporation tax. So I know that people out there, there is a debate about it at this time, given the backdrop to all of this in terms of the cuts that have come from London. And people are talking about affordability, but for us it's about getting the power, and then our executive will decide how we use that power. Mackay. So far. Uh, can I ask the Minister, in terms of corporation tax, in what circumstances uh, would he feel that it would be possible to make changes to the corporation tax rate uh, if and when the power has been transferred to the executive? Well, I mean, as I've said, the important thing at this point is to uh, get the power transferred, and then we can decide on how and when it can be best utilised. But obviously, we must be satisfied that the prevailing economic conditions should be conducive to any change in the rate. In the current context of saving, of savage cuts to our block grant, I think it is clear that the issue uh, will need to be satisfactorily uh, addressed. Nevertheless, I am in favour of all powers being repatriated from London, and I note that George Osborne's comments during his autumn statement, but it, uh, it is this Assembly and the Executive uh, which should decide the terms and conditions of when any changes to the corporation ta uh, rate tax are, are made. So it's a big issue. Uh, I know, as I've said earlier, there's a, a big debate out there. Many different voices uh, have uh, been raised. And I think that's good. I think it's absolutely essential that people have a very clear understanding of what we're uh, getting ourselves into. But I think in any circumstance where a power is devolved, then the ability to use that power in whatever way we want resides with the executive. And uh, I don't think that the executive that we're part of is going to be in any way uh, foolhardy about how we would utilise such a power. And I know the big debate is around can we afford it vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the, the, the way in which departments have been cut over, the, over recent times. But we are going to two important talks over the course of the next couple of days. Uh, we are speaking with the United Voice in relation to uh, the need for David Cameron to recognise that when he comes here, he does not come here as someone facilitating talks. He comes here as a player in the talks uh, and with a particular contribution to make also. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Deputy First Minister as well. Um, could, could the Deputy First Minister, and indeed he made reference there to David Cameron coming this week, uh, could he give us an assessment um, if any clarity has been sought by or from the British Government, particularly in regard to their position on Europe and the implications it may have? The Irish Government has consistently portrayed um, itself and indeed the levers it has at its disposal as being the gateway to Europe, including one of those is reduced corporation tax. Um, in the event of Euroscepticism prevailing, uh, has the, the Minister made any assessment of its effect, positive or otherwise? I think it would be mainly negative on the likes of uh, even with corporation tax renewed here in the North, in that we would just be really a fortress and not a gateway to Europe, to the rest of Europe. Well, I mean, our, our focus, as always, is on how we can uh, lower the unacceptable rate of unemployment uh, which exists. Uh, we've been very lucky over the course of the last uh, 22 months that we've managed each month to lower the uh, unemployment figures, but much more work needs to be done, particularly uh, west of the ban. Uh, and I think that the, the challenges uh, that we face uh, are challenges that require the support of different institutions. I certainly know that whenever the First Minister and myself travel for what has been a very successful exercise in attracting foreign direct investment from the United States, that 
nearly all of the major businesses that we speak to in the United States uh, talk about the importance of the relationship of this island with Europe. And so whenever there is a debate uh, ha happening in, in England around the uh, prospect that there will be a withdrawal from Europe, uh, that's big stuff as far as uh, we uh, and I think Scotland and Wales uh, and the south of Ireland are concerned also. So I think that the, my, own, my own view is that the suggestion made by uh, Nicola Sturgeon, the new First Minister of Scotland, that in the event that there would be a referendum, that the devolved administration should have the right to have their own referendum. Uh, speaking personally, I don't think there would be any doubt whatsoever how the people of the North would vote. I think uh, they would vote for us to continue uh, with what has been a very productive relationship in terms of foreign direct investment in the United States, but also very productive relationship with the European Union, which has been very supportive of us for a very long time. And I, and just to make the point that uh, you know, members should actually take the opportunity to put a question as, and be as direct as possible. Ministers have two minutes to answer, but members don't have two minutes to uh, get around to asking their question. John McAllister. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and grateful to the Deputy First Minister. I could I uh, ask, he rightly points out that, that um, there's five-party agreement around getting corporation tax devolved, but there's probably no agreement as to what to do with it. And in light of the First Minister's comments about the functionality of this Assembly, and indeed Bro uh, McFerrin's comments uh, about whether Northern Ireland is ready for it, does the Deputy First Minister feel that this Assembly needs to be reformed uh, to make it ready and functional for corporation tax? Well, I, I, I know the member uh, ha, has his own quite legitimate uh, agenda in relation to his bill, which he, he has been in discussion both with the First Minister and myself and I believe all our parties in the Assembly. But I certainly hope for a successful outcome to the talks this week. I think it is absolutely vital for the uh, institution itself, for the executive, and for the people out there who are looking for leadership from their politicians to get an agreement. Uh, in the course of trying to achieve that agreement, uh, I think that we have already achieved considerable agreement, particularly around uh, budget ratios. Uh, the fact is that all of the parties in this assembly are in favour of uh, having the power to decide uh, what our what level our corporation tax uh, should be. Uh, have we got the ability to deal with that? Uh, absolutely, I think we have. But I think that the, uh, the talks this week uh, will tell the tale in relation to how uh, this institution either goes forward or doesn't go forward over the course of uh, uh, both the medium and the longer term. So, so there are big challenges, but I think certainly in the context of knowing what to do with having the power uh, devolved to us in relation to corporation tax. Uh, I don't think there's anybody in the executive is under any illusions about how we need to take that forward. We do have a plan, and it is a plan which I think has the overwhelming support of the business community. Thank you. And I call Mr Ian McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question three. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, uh, Junior Minister McCann will answer this question. Section 75 of the NI Act 1998, together with Schedule 9 to the Act, places a statutory obligation on public authorities in carrying out their various functions to have due regard to the need to promote equality of opportunity, and that is between persons of different religious belief, political opinion, racial group, age, marital status or sexual orientation. It is also between men and women generally between persons with a disability and persons without a disability, and between persons with dependents and persons without dependents. In addition, without prejudice to this obligation, public authorities are also required to have regard to the desirability of promoting good relations between persons of different religious belief, political opinion and racial group. The statutory obligations are largely implemented through equality schemes approved by the Equality Commission and by screening and carrying out equality impact assessments on policies. All government policy is developed within the context of the equality of opportunity provisions set out in section 75.1 of the NI Act 1998. 
Mr. McRae for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Setting aside the disgraceful comments by Jerry Adams when he said the point is to actually break these bees and what's going to break them is equality, can the junior minister, on behalf of the Deputy First Minister, categorically state whether or not they agree with these sentiments? Well, I, I think that, that Jerry Adams has already um, uh, clarified his position on those comments. But can I say that, um, you know, in terms of the OFMD, FM's responsibility, we are certainly committed to equality, and we will continue to work for the removal of any barriers that are there that prevent such equality. And that equality has to go right across the board. It's about social equality, economic equality, cultural um, equality as well. And I think that that you know no one should be um, you know trying to put up barriers or trying to prevent equality legislation being brought forward in any way. I'll call Mr. Sean Lynch. One of the outstanding issues from the St Andrews Agreement is the single equality bill. Will one be brought forward soon? Well, the member makes a, a very valid point. Um, at present, anti discrimination legislation in the North, as I said, covered all the things in, in my previous answer. But the relevant legislation, um, obviously, there, there's a lot of equality legislation out there, and there was um, a lot of uh, support for a single equality bill to be brought forward because the idea of harmonising all of the existing provisions into one piece of legislation through a single equality bill, extending and updating that where appropriate, um, seemed to be the best way forward. And I would hope. While you know, it hasn't moved forward, um, I think, from, 19, uh, from 2006, I would hope that there would still be agreement to take that single equality bill forward. I call Mr Chris Little. Can I ask the Minister, uh, that, does she agree that the politicisation uh, of equality provision as uh, a Trojan horse is unacceptable, and will she take an opportunity to reject these comments? I, I don't think that, that, that really you know, um, uh, any politicisation of any um, issue around equality is acceptable. I think that, that equality is something, as I said, that is a basic human right for people. Um, I think that everyone should be treated the same. We should respect people um, and be tolerant of, of people and respect diversity as well. And certainly all equality legislation in terms of what's there now. Um, I think that, that we need to be enforcing that in any way that we can, and we need to ensure that it is monitored and it is um, the, that all equality legislation, by all you know, central government, local government, uh, indeed any um, public bodies, um, uh, needs to be um, uh, adhered to. And I believe that, that nobody um, should use uh, equality in any way um, in terms for political reasons. I call Mr. Jim Allister. Given the imperative and the guidance issued by the Minister's party president, does she really think that anyone will believe her protestations that she is not using her office to, advance, to use equality as a Trojan horse to advance the Republican strategy? And if she is not, will she repudiate without equivocation all of those remarks? Well, I'll say to the members I've said in my previous answers, you know, um, the equality agenda is, is something that needs to be um, totally adhered to by all. I believe that it is only through the process and the equality agenda, and indeed through, through pro progressing issues like a Bill of Rights for the North here, where everyone will be entitled to equality, and also that it's in terms of bringing forward equality, equality legislation, and indeed the equality principles and the ethos of equality, nobody should be putting any barriers up to that. It's the only thing that is going to challenge, in my view, bigotry, intolerance and the disrespect that many people have for other people's cultures, other people's religion, other people's sexual orientation in our society. And in my mind, it's the only way that we can ensure that people are treated with respect and dignity in our society. I call Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you. Question four, please. Uh, neither the department nor any of its arm's length bodies have provided or administered funding to Gulladoff Hall or to the South Derry Cultural and Heritage Society. The Deputy First Minister. <laughs> Should I go ahead? Is that fine, Mr. Speaker? 
I thank the Deputy First Minister for, for, for clarifying uh, that, uh, that information. Uh, can I further ask the Deputy First Minister if he agrees that the revelations in the, spotlight, the BBC Spotlight programme merit a serious investigation into just how this hall and the South, uh, South Derry Cultural and Heritage Society were funded? Well, uh, uh, Spotlight made an allegation that Sinn Féin was engaged in some form of fraudulent activity. That is not the case. Sinn Féin could have developed the site and rented it back to uh, representatives, just like many other parties. In this case, local people, including Sinn Féin members, took a decision to develop the site for wider community use. Uh, this is a sustainable approach to community development. In the programme, three out of the four trustees acknowledged that they and not Sinn Féin owned the site. And of course, the BBC relied on one trustee who is uh, now uh, a member of uh, a so-called Republican organisation, Republican Sinn Féin, a dissident group. Uh, and that member actually had a public commemoration in, in Derry City uh, just a few short years ago publicly called for my execution. So I think that uh, th this attempt to, to smear Sinn Féin is very clear for all to see. And uh, I think that isn't what we expect from uh, impartial journalism. Order. Now, I will take action if people are going to shout from a set and right position. The rules are very clear and no one in this room should be under any misapprehension. Dolores Kelly. Uh, I note uh, the initial question asked about arm's length bodies, but could the uh, Deputy First Minister indicate to whether or not uh, any monies from the Social Investment Fund is uh, being uh, targeted uh, in this area? geographical area where these two organisations are based? Well, how, how money in uh, social investment fund areas are targeted is a matter for the uh, groups that were established to prioritise the uh, benefits to the local community through funds from the social investment fund uh, being uh, utilised for the purposes of support for that community. Uh, from, from my perspective, uh, I have been in Gullaroff Hall quite a number of times. Uh, that hall is used extensively. Uh, I was there recently when uh, a member of the local community died and uh, the uh, congregation uh, at the church uh, uh, came back to the hall uh, where they were provided with uh, sustenance. Uh, I have been at many other venues in the South Derry area, uh, such as uh, GA clubs, that provide a similar service. So I think that it's very wrong for people to uh, not recognise the massive contribution that these uh, halls and support services uh, make to the local community. It is absolutely essential that uh, these communities uh, are supported and have people within them who are uh, in a position to provide uh, not just a venue but support for them, uh, particularly at a time of grief. I call Mr. Alec Maskey. I'd like to thank the Minister for his response so far. Given that the, uh, the original question uh, dealt with uh, allegations levelled in a spot aid programme, could the uh, Deputy First Minister uh, give us his views on the allegations contained in the spot aid programme? Well, many of the allegations contained in the programme were neither uh, factual nor impartial. Uh, just taking the Gullard Duff Centre as uh, one example, as I said, out of the uh, four trustees, three of the trustees said that uh, the building uh, wasn't owned by Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin didn't own the site. But, however, uh, the BBC decided to rely on one trustee who was on the public record uh, not so long ago at a public event in uh, Derry, uh, in the cemetery in Derry, I think it was, where he publicly called uh, on me to be executed. So I think that that raises all sorts of questions about how impartial uh, the journalism was in relation to all of this, and I think that the BBC should correct that.
Uh, order that completes the uh, the time for listed questions. Uh, we now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister? Does he believe that, given the, the launch of the private members' bill today to include a conscience clause, would he agree that the Equality Commission should now withdraw legal action against Isher's Bakery pending the outcome of the legislative process? Uh, with your permission, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, Junior Minister McKeon will answer this question. <clears throat> Thank you, Member. First question. I, I'm aware that there was some discussions that taken place um, between the Equality Commission and the bakery um, prior to the civil case being taken. And I think the main issue um, is the extent to which suppliers of goods services um, can refuse a service on grounds of sexual orientation, religious beliefs and political opinion. And I think the civil case will determine whether any discrimination has in fact taken place. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Thank the junior minister for her answer. Would she agree that the Equality Commission should withdraw their legal action pending the action against Ushers at this time? Well, can I just say to the member that, that you know it, it isn't up to OFMDFM in terms of the, the, the disagree or, or to agree with the Equality Commission. They are their own body and they have an independent role to advance fairness and equality for all. And they also have a role to, um, they're responsible for implementing legislation on all those cases and uh, actually challenging discrimination. And you know, I think that we have to leave it to the Equality Commission um, in terms of um, whatever happens there, because in the end of the day, you know, that, that is um, going to be um, a place where, where they actually um, see if discrimination did in fact happen, and I am sure that the Equality Commission um, will know, or sorry, um, have taken whatever measures they could have beforehand before actually entering into that case. Well, Lord Morrow. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the uh, Deputy First Minister how confident is he that the present talks will be concluded in the timescale as outlined by the Prime Minister David Cameron? <clears throat> Well, I think more than David Cameron outlined the time frame for the talks, uh, it appears to me from the discussions that I have been involved in that there is a universal uh, agreement that uh, if these talks are not concluded before Christmas, then there is little or no prospect whatsoever in the aftermath of Christmas uh, of us finding a way forward. So it is absolutely vital that we conclude uh, these discussions. Uh, I would like to see it done by the end of this week, aiming uh, to do that. I think the fact that both the Taoiseach and David Cameron uh, have announced that they are coming here on Thursday uh, is uh, a very clear indicator that uh, people recognise that we are coming to the crunch in relation to these talks. It, it's not as if you know, we're coming all, all, at all this afresh. You know, we've been round the mulberry bush with this for the last year and a half in relation to uh, the Haas O'Sullivan discussions, uh, the progress that was made there. So the issues are all very, very clear for all of the parties. We all know what the issues are. That there is an added complication. The added complication is obviously the budgetary uh, situation, the austerity agenda. Uh, embarked upon uh, by the coalition government, uh, which uh, does have a dramatic impact on a society emerging from the sort of conflict that we have emerged from over the course of recent times. So I think that uh, if there's a will, there's a way to ensure that these discussions are successful. I think people outside are crying out for that. They're crying out for leadership. And I certainly think from our perspective, uh, in, in Sinn Féin and, and even in the course of the negotiations we were involved in with the DUP and, and other parties in relation to the St Andrews talks and the Hillsborough talks, you know, uh, the past record in achieving things has been good. The last two years have been terrible and we rapidly well, need to put drill. an end to that and we need to ensure that we are all working very closely together over the next few days. I have listened carefully to what the Deputy First Minister has said. 
If the success of these talks depended on him revealing his past involvement in the legal activities, would you still be confident of success? I am uh, always confident of success, uh, and I am also around the political process to know that uh, the events of the last uh, 30 or 40 years uh, don't all come to my door. They come to the doors of many parties and participants, not least the British government, not least previous uh, administrations in the North, and not least uh, those who have supported the activities of uh, particularly uh, the British Army, uh, the RUC, British military intelligence, the importation of arms, uh, collusion, uh, manipulating loyalist death squads, down to many, many others. What we need to do is recognise, as we did do during the course of the Haas negotiations, is that we need to find solutions. We need to provide a menu of options for people uh, so that they can access, so that they can find out uh, their truth about what happened uh, to their family, for example. And that's the big challenge for all of us. Uh, we went into the Haas uh, negotiations on the basis of having our own position in regard to the three main issues, the past, parades and the whole issue of identity. We compromised during the course of that. Sadly, others weren't able to meet us in relation to that compromise. But that compromise did provide a way forward. And I made it absolutely clear during the course of those uh, negotiations that in providing mechanisms to deal with this, that uh, I, for one, will be advocating that Republicans and indeed all others uh, should uh, contribute to any successful outcome which will deal with uh, the whole issue of uh, the past. Sir Trevor Lunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister, just going back to corporation tax, if, if the announcement by the, the Chancellor of an increased tax on diverted profits will impact on the new arrangements for corporation tax in this part of the country? Well, I, I think all of that remains to, to be seen. I, I think that we're all uh, very conscious that if we can uh, have the uh, power devolved to us, then that will obviously be, uh, I think, a, a very important uh, discussion has to take place at the executive, but also between the executive and the powers that be in London, including uh, the Treasury. So we have been involved in discussions, as m many members of this House will know, over the course of the last couple of years in relation to uh, corporation tax. Any complication that might flow from that is something that will have to be addressed by the Finance Minister, the Deputy Minister and the First Minister and myself. None for supplementary. Yes, I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. Um, would it be the intention that uh, profits earned on production in Northern Ireland will be taxed in Northern Ireland? And flowing from that, does he anticipate that we may have the option of an increased tax for diverted profits on the same lines as the Chancellor has suggested for Great Britain? Well, obviously the power over taxation rests with uh, the Treasury and with, uh, with all our institutions in, uh, in England. Uh, and I certainly think that from uh, our perspective, we will be very keenly interested to see how that will be dealt with. Obviously, in an answer like this, I'm not going, going to go into the detail of the discussions that we've had with the Treasury uh, or others in, in the course of this exercise, except to say that uh, there, there is a debate uh, around the whole issue of uh, fiscal levers and how that could be utilised to our advantage. That doesn't mean to say that there's uh, there is an accord between all of us in terms of how that would be dealt with. That, I think, would be the subject of some uh, negotiation between us, uh, and then if we did get agreement between ourselves and London. But, I mean, one issue that has been raised in the course of uh, recent times is that if we manage to create the tens of thousands of new jobs uh, and uh, put people into employment, that uh, the taxation raised uh, in all of that uh, would be the subject of some considerable discussion in relation to uh, how we could benefit. <clears throat> call, Mr. I, Dr. Alistair Macdonald. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And could I maybe reflect back to the talks process earlier? Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me 
that the outcome of this talks process has to be comprehensive and provide a conclusive agreement on the way forward across all the issues that are on the table. And I mean not just finance, but the Haas, the whole Haas bundle, the structures and function, and the unfinished business of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, I absolutely agree with uh, the member. Uh, I do believe that uh, any agreement short of a comprehensive agreement uh, would be, uh, I think, held up to public ridicule. We, we face huge challenges, uh, which are, as many people know, budgetary, but they're also in relation to how we deal with the past, how we deal with the whole issue of identity, and how we deal with parades. And we just have to look at what happened on the streets over the course of the last uh, two years. I certainly don't want to see that repeated. And of course, that was specifically over the flag uh, protests and the protests over uh, the whole issue of parades. Uh, and I, I do have a very uh, strong view that all of us within these institutions have a duty and a responsibility to uh, agree a, a comprehensive way forward on all of these very difficult issues, which, if they're not dealt with, <coughs> Uh, can and conceivably could uh, jump up to bite us in the course of the coming years, and I think the community deserves better than that. And Dr. McDonald for the supplement. Thank you very much. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister if he believes at this stage or for his assessment on whether the Prime Minister and the Taoiseach uh, will are, uh, will, are in a position to help us over the line come Thursday, or will it take a bit more time? Well, I, I think we need to be aiming to get this done for the weekend. Uh, I think I, I heard the First Minister say uh, on BBC Radio just uh, an hour or two ago that uh, if enough progress was made and it took another day or two, that uh, we, we could live with that. And I could live with that, but we can't live with this going past Christmas. And that appears to be agreed by everybody. So there's a big challenge for all of us to get this done. And one of the biggest challenges is for David Cameron himself to face up to the case that the First Minister and I and all our parties have made in relation to uh, budgetary uh, decisions that they have made, the austerity agenda, which is impacting so negatively on our situation. Uh, I, I do think that it, it's also important to say that the First Minister and I had a useful discussion on the margins of the, uh, of the NSMC meeting in Armagh on uh, Wednesday. And, uh, for example, when I raised the issue of the Irish Government's funding commitment uh, for the A5 road, uh, I got a very encouraging answer, which I will continue to explore, and no doubt the First Minister will continue to explore uh, with the Taoiseach. So, he certainly gave a very strong indication during the course of our deliberations in Armagh that he recognises that uh, budgetary issues are going to have to be dealt with uh, by both him and the British government during the course of our talks in the next few days. And I call Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Deputy First Minister if he will confirm that uh, social investment funding uh, is ring fenced? and that it will not be subject to departmental cuts? Uh, with your permission, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, Junior Minister McKeon will take this. Well, obviously we are dealing with um, the pressures, budget pressures, because of the, um, the, I feel like, you know, the cuts to the block grant. I mean, 3.6 billion has been taken out of the, the budget in previous years until now. So 2015-16, will most definitely be the worst year and that, that is the last year of the four year budget cycle. And I believe that, that um, you know we would hope that, that uh, the social investment fund obviously would be going forward. And I know there's twenty three projects that's already been signed off on and there's other ones sitting um, waiting to be signed off. Um, they are projects that, that really you know will make a big difference in local communities. They're projects that have been sort of um, developed from the community um, side up. So um, we're hopeful that we will be able to um, we will be able to actually deliver those. But the thing is, you know, unless we do get um, the the economic uh, injection that the Deputy First Minister talked about, you know, that we are facing into um, more economic constraints than probably we, we have never faced before. So I do believe 
that you know um, that, that while we're, we're trying our best to ensure that those projects from the, the social investment fund go forward, that there is a danger where, where you know that, that, that you know a lot of programmes, a lot of pro projects, very very essential services for people on the ground, frontline services will be affected. And uh, that brings us to the end of the. Uh, the period for questions to OFM DFM and we now